One of my favorite examples of branching recursion is using recursion to find shortest paths in mazes. And so I want to talk about that now. For our maze, we're going to use a grid where every element in the grid can either be an open space or a closed space. We could call it a wall. And I've started off by creating a 2D array and it's an array of integers where I use zeros for open spaces and ones for where walls are. And the idea is we're supposed to get from one location to another. I intend to make it so we get from the beginning to the end. And we're going to do this using a recursive algorithm. Now, it's worth spending some time thinking about how you might go about this if you didn't use recursion and what that code would look like. The challenge here so I believe the shortest path through this maze is actually to go down here and then to here and then down and around over to there. Okay. The challenge is when you have branches and that's the whole thing that loops as we've said don't necessarily do all that well. Uh, you can solve this problem with loops. There are several ways that you can solve this problem with loops but most of them involve using extra storage for data uh, to keep track of what's going on. With recursion, this is actually a fairly simple problem to solve. So the idea here is we're going to pass in the maze that we want to solve, which is an array of array of int. We're going to pass in the, let's go with a uh, yeah, we'll call them X and Y. An X location and a Y location and then also where they're trying to get to. An end X and an end Y. Now, instead of returning the actual path, I'm just going to make this algorithm return the length of the path. It turns out that if you have that information, you can figure out which direction to, to go and it has the advantage that it's not ambiguous. Whereas there might be five different ways through a maze that are all the shortest length and they're all ties and then you have to decide which one you're going to return. If the shortest path has 30 steps on it, the shortest path has 30 steps on it and there's no ambiguity there. Regardless of how many paths there might be that only take 30 steps. This is a recursive algorithm. So the first thing I want to start off with is my base cases. Okay, when can I just stop and say I'm done? Well, one is we're at the end. So if x is ex and y is ey, we're at the end and we're supposed to return how many steps it takes to get to the end. Well, it takes zero steps to get to the end if you're already at the end. What if you're not at the end? Well, the next base case is the base case for you've gone someplace that you're not allowed to be. It could be you're out of bounds. So for example, if x is less than 0, or x is greater than or equal to maze.length, or y is less than 0, or y is greater than or equal to maze sub x dot length. That means that you went out of the bounds of the maze, which isn't a legal move, and so you're not allowed to do that. The other thing that you could do that would be illegal would be to try to walk through a wall. Okay, so if you land on a square that's a wall, that would be maze sub x sub y is less than zero. That's also this base case. Okay, you don't get to do that. What happens in this base case? Well, we're just going to give back a value. And I'm not going to fill in what this value is yet because the thing is, it needs to be something that is definitely not a real answer. Okay. And it might seem obvious, hey, we could return negative 1. Negative 1 is definitely not the length of the shortest path. When we write the recursive case, though, you'll see why I don't want to do that, why I'm not going to return negative 1 here. So we'll come back and fill this in in just a bit. Okay, what if it's not a base case? So I am standing somewhere in this maze, like maybe there. That's my x, y location. I have you know, different directions that I could go. If I somehow, let's just assume that I had some magic oracle 
that could tell me how many steps it was from my adjacent squares. <clears throat> if I had that thing, I could ask it how long it was from one above me, one below me, one to the right, one to the left, and I would pick the smallest of those. Okay? Because if I could somehow get the answer for my adjacent squares, then I would want the smallest of those answers and then I'd have to add one to it because getting from here over to the next square takes one step. So that's exactly what we're going to put inside of our code. We're going to have four recursive calls here. We're going to call shortest path, same maze. We're going to call it with x plus one and the same y and the same end location. We're also going to call it with x minus one. We're going to call it with y plus one and with y minus one. So we make four recursive calls. And then we have to figure out how to combine them. And how are we going to make a single solution out of these four calls? Well, we've already said, I want the smallest of these. And fortunately, there is that nice infix notation in Scala where I can just put min, much like I would put plus. So go to the right, the min of the right, the left, going up, going down. And then I need all of those plus one because I had to take one step to get to each of these. Now, at this point, we can go back and we can answer the question of what goes into these question marks. Because I'm using min here, it turns out that negative one probably isn't the ideal value because negative one would be the smallest. Instead, I'm going to return a value that is very large. It's so large that it can't possibly be the answer. But it's not going to be integer or int dot max value. And understand why. Imagine that all four of these somehow gave us max int dot max value, and then we add one to it. When you add one to max value, it becomes the min value. So instead, I'm just going to return a billion. It is large enough that I'm not creating a maze where the shortest path is going to have a billion steps in it. And it is small enough that it's not close to max value and I have no chance of overflowing it. Okay. Let's try running this. So we're going to call, let's print out the result of shortest path starting, so on the maze, starting at 0, 0 and going to 9, 9. This maze happens to be a 10 by 10 maze. And we run it. And boom, it crashed. Okay. Line 19 called line 20, called line 19, called line 20. What are those lines? No, nope. this is 19, this is 20. We take a step to the right, we take a step to the left. We take a step to the right, we take a step to the left. Yeah, the way this is written right now, we have, we literally have the ability, and we've told the computer, to go from here to here, and then back, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, until it overflows the stack. Okay? You'll note that this stack trace is really, really long. Okay? We just kept calling the same function over and over again, and walking back and forth in the maze. We somehow have to prevent ourselves from doing that. So when I talk about what we're going to do here, I refer to the, uh, the fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel. And we're going to throw down some breadcrumbs. And these breadcrumbs will tell us where we've been in the maze. That way we don't repeat our steps. We don't, go, we don't run in circles. Okay? And that's, that's what we have to prevent. We have to prevent ourselves from running in circles. It turns out that we will want to be able to hit the same square more than once, but we shouldn't do it by running in circles. So I'm going to take the location that I'm at, and I'm going to set it equal to negative 2. And that'll be the value of my breadcrumb. Uh, this part of the reason why I went with integers instead of booleans, one, they are a little bit easier to type in. Two, I can put different values. Three, uh, something we won't do in this visit with recursion, but in my next semester materials, I'll show how we can optimize this to, to make it work better. 
and we'll do it in a way where having integers is helpful. So it turns out that we have to not only drop down the breadcrumbs, we have to pick them back up. And to understand this, imagine that we took the path going around the top all the way over to here. Okay? And we left a breadcrumb on that square. Well, there's a much shorter path that goes through that same square. In fact, all solutions have to go through this square. If we don't sweep up our breadcrumbs as we're popping out of the recursion, then we're going to miss the shortest path. So when I'm done with this, I have to set this back to zero. Okay, So I'm sweeping up my breadcrumbs. If you want, you could think of it as kite string instead of breadcrumbs. It's actually, kite string is very helpful in if you go down into caves so that you can keep track of, of where you came from. Val answer equals. Because I am now doing some other stuff in there, zero insert. Because I'm now doing some other stuff inside of here, I have to store this and make sure that we give it back at the end. Okay, let's try this again and see if it will overflow. And it doesn't, it says 24. Well, let's check that. So if I were right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 steps. That's our shortest path. So we've written a nice branching recursive function here. It calls itself four times and it tries all four. So I think this is kind of the quintessential example of how branching recursion allows you to try different options and then come back to, to where you were. And it's the memory of the stack that allows you to come back and try some other option. To help you understand this algorithm, we'll come back in the next video and we'll visualize this so that you can see what it's doing.